Good evening, I am Alex York, and it is my honor to serve as adjunct faculty in the Integrative Health Studies Department at Maryland University of Integrative Health. On behalf of MUIH, I welcome you to this webinar. Tonight's event is the second in the series of conversations we will host throughout the year. The aim of this series is to examine the health inequities and disparities that exist in integrative health field. If you missed our first webinar in this series, um, which was with Sankofa Health out of Laurel, Maryland, you can still view it by navigating over to MUIH's YouTube page and clicking the videos tab, which I highly encourage you to do. It was a great webinar. Um, we view these webinars as an opportunity for us to come together as a community, to engage with these issues and learn from the community leaders and scholars that we have here in these webinars. Um, how we address these issues starts with what we think and how we talk about them. So by gathering and engaging with these issues, we contribute to the larger conversation that informs how we address these issues in integrative health at the local and national level. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us tonight and joining the conversation. Before I introduce our speakers for this evening, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, all the cameras and mics will be disabled during the presentation. And if you would like to ask a question um, at the conclusion of the presentation, you can uh, um, use the Q&A section uh, as the Q&A box, um, that is where uh, we'll be able to easily see your questions. And we encourage you to use the chat box during the presentation to share your thoughts or reflections as well. So now I would like to introduce our speakers for the evening. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Waite and Dr. Sawyer. Dr. Roberta Waite has had a long professional career as a nurse working in trauma, one level academic health systems as a clinician and administrator, and in higher education working at Drexel University for the past 19 years. Dr. Wade is a tenured professor in doctoral nursing and associate dean of community-centered health and wellness and academic integration at Drexel. She serves as uh, the executive director of the Stephen and Sandra uh, Scheller 11th Street Family Health Services of Drexel University, operated in partnership with the Family Practice and Counseling Network. She created the Macy Undergraduate Leadership Fellows Program and Interdisciplinary Program for students in the College of Nursing and Health Professions and the School of Public Health, focusing on leadership development while concurrently fostering critical consciousness using a social justice lens. Dr. Wade's scholarship and research centers, er, centers on behavioral health, structural influences of health and racial justice. In May 2022, Dr. Waite will start at Georgetown University School of Nursing as Dean Select and Tenured Professor, and her deanship will start in July 2022. She serves as Board of Director for Corporate Trinity Health, a leading national multi-institutional Catholic health care delivery system operating 92 hospitals in 22 states, including 120 continuing care locations, encompassing home care, hospice, PACE, and senior living centers the Family Process Institute and the Independence Blue Cross Foundation. She currently served as an expert for Governor Wolf's think tank to develop guidelines and benchmarks for a trauma-informed Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and served as co-chair of the Racial and Communal Trauma Prevention Action Team for HEAL, Pennsylvania's trauma-informed uh, PA leadership team. Dr. Wade also served on both the advisory group for COACH, which is, stands for Collaborative Opportunities to Advance Community Health, a cross-sector collaborative uh, that brings together health systems and community-based organizations to address community health needs in greater Philadelphia, and the Advancing Health Equity Leading Care Payment and Systems Transformation Program, National Advisory Committee supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So welcome, Dr. Wade. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Sawyer, Dr. Sawyer is the equity implementation strategist for uh, the um, uh, NHSA's Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health Community Care Initiative. Prior to this role, Dr. Sawyer served as the director of community health, wellness, and strategic partnerships for the Stephen and Sandra Scheller 11th Street Family Health Practice of Drexel University. She also served as a former director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Sawyer serves as a faculty member for the Arcadia University College of Health Sciences. Dr. Sawyer has dedicated over 15 years to public health service and specializes on the sanctuary trauma-informed care model and anti-racism practice and racial trauma integration as a social determinant of health. She earned her master's in public health in 2016 from Drexel University, Dormsif, I apologize if I didn't say that correctly, School of Public Health, she graduated with honors, earning a um, ED D degree in leadership and management with a 
uh, concentration in policy in 2021 from Drexel University School of Education and was named the recipient for the Dr. Terrence Daniels Memorial Award for her research centered on social justice and equity within academic institutions. A very, very big welcome to you both and thank you so much for spending your evening with us. I will hand it over to you both for the presentation. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, we are so delighted to be here to be able to share in this important conversation this evening on integrated care and advancing health equity at a federally qualified health center. And specifically, we're gonna be talking about the 11th Street Family Health Services Center. So both Dr. Sawyer and myself look forward to a spirited discussion. Um, we wanna have a lot of questions also at the end of our presentation. Next slide. So as a roadmap, we just wanna highlight some of the objectives. We're gonna discuss the evolution of the model of care incorporating integrated services at the 11th Street Family Health Services Center. Describe the integral nature of community linked to the practice, as well as highlight the clinical and academic interface. So those are gonna be the three sort of um, breakout points that we're gonna do a deeper dive into. Next slide. So while we're gonna talk about um, integrated um, issues, and you can hit it again for the other pictures to come onto the slide, um, the backdrop is key. So I really wanted to give the backdrop of 11th Street because it was created and spearheaded by Dr. Patricia Garrity in partnership with community. So in talking about Dr. Garrity, I think her unique lens was really important in how she thought about the 11th Street Family Health Services Center. Dr. Garrity is a nurse by profession. She started off working at CHOP in pediatrics and she earned her master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Pennsylvania. Her focus was in public health thereafter, but she got her doctorate in city and regional planning. So how she thought about health and looking at the environment and location and spaces and where people lived was really unique. And so I think that also added a lens with how she sort of motivated and moved forward um, in thinking about health and creating the space in partnership with um, community members. Dr. Garrity started off her professional career academically at LaSalle. She created a nurse managed center at LaSalle. And then in the 1990s, she came to Drexel University School of Public Health. And they wanted to do something, create something special within the lower North Philadelphia area. Um, and within that area, we have a number of academic institutions. The area is a medically underserved space and it's predominantly housed um, resided African-Americans. She knew going into that space as a white woman with a PhD, the residents living within that space, there was a lot of lack of trust with her, as well as with other academic institutions because they would go in, assess, and then they would take their information and leave and not really benefit the residents that are there. So after time, she really developed and worked hard with um, building trust with the residents there. They saw that she was committed and really finding out what is it that the residents wanted. When we're thinking about health, we could easily look at the state, the uh, Department of Philadelphia and say, you have these chronic health conditions, but that's not what you do when you're partnering with community. So in looking at those key issues that community had, they really wanted to find ways to improve safety because there wasn't a stop sign on the corner. She worked with city rep representatives and she got a stop sign put on the corner. They were concerned about their children because with the housing developments, there were fenced in areas and children were getting into those areas and bitten by dogs. So she worked with the Humane Society. Residents also wanted to learn how to do CPR because unfortunately, sometimes there was a slow response rate for ambulance. So she had public health nurses set up at the different housing developments and they taught the residents how to do CPR. And that's just 
a few examples, but it was a number of different things that the residents wanted. And so she was able to fulfill that. And doing those things over time, she was able to build up trust. And after that time, residents came and they wanted to, wanted to have something else special. And in order to do that, um, they went forward and they had a future search. Next slide, please. So with this future search, you can hit it again, thank you. Um, so with this future search, you brought together community members, city officials, local businesses, and you stay set up and identified what did they want actually within that space. And these are some of the original pictures of the groups that came together. And from this, the community identified they wanted a health center, but not a health center where people went just when they were sick. They wanted a health center that was part of the community where people would come there even to get services to promote their health. And so that was really the foundation on which this, um, the 11th Street Health Center was born from, um, that specific piece. Next slide. So what happened then was it was fine to do an assessment and you can hit this um, button again. So Dr. Garrity and community, they did an assessment. Um, when they did this assessment for HHS to put forth a grant to secure funds to build the building, they got it on their first try. And residents wanted that then because you needed to have that initial data to provide in the packet for the grant. They got the grant on the first run. Um, and unfortunately though, the building wasn't there. So the residents cleared out some of the house, some of the uh, two rooms actually, and one of the housing developments and nurse practitioners from Drexel University practiced within that space for several years while the building was being built. So what's here on this slide, the red brick building is the original building which opened in September of 2002. And importantly, when you get the funds, you have to make a 25 year commitment to be able to sustain to be within that space. And because many of the individuals who are going to be coming in, they were not going to be paying by cash, nor did many have commercial insurance. So at that time, they got um, they secured additional assistance from HHS to explore a linkage with an existing federally qualified healthcare center. And that's what born the partnership between Drexel University College of Nursing and Health Professions and Family Practice and Counseling Network, which is the FQHC. So Dr. Garrity's picture is at the top. And then at the bottom, we have a picture of Donna Teresi because she was the founding nurse for the Family Practice and Counseling Network, which has several sites throughout the city of Philadelphia. Next slide, please. So this is just um, an illustration because we they do actually have more sites than this now, but this shows the large sites. So what happened was Family Practice and Counseling Network, which is the FQHC, has two other large sites, which is Health Annex and Abbotsford. And then with the linkage with Drex University College of Nursing and Health Professions um, was linked to 11th Street Family Health Services Center. So these are two major organizations that are coming together with a similar mission of wanting to serve the community to really support this partnership. So I just wanted to give that illustration because there are very much so intricacies that are there. Um, but I think that really um, highlights some important key points. Um, and next, we're gonna move forward um, to the next slide because while the building was built in 2000, open rather in 2002, it has grown immensely over the years. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, the clinical services a little bit later, but we did have an expansion um, in 2015, which was on the previous slide, um, the expansion that took place. So we're going to move now into the community center portion, which is incredibly important because as I mentioned, the 11th Street Health Center was started in partnership with community. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Sawyer. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, for having us um, discuss this very important topic. Um, so we're going to move on to the next slide. So community wellness and strategic partnerships. Uh, the forging of community relationship and strategic partnerships is pivotal for any integrated uh, health center. Its essence is accentuated in integrative health centers such as the Stephen and Sandra Scheller um, 11th Street Health Services, particularly due to its geography and also with the community that we serve, that as we saw at the top of the meeting, the top of this presentation, um, where exactly um, 11th Street Health Center is and who is the community that, that we actually serve, which are predominantly um, our Black communities. So while the center serves a geogra geographically diverse population, its support is centered um, in local community members who are socially and economically disadvantaged. Next slide. So it's a beautiful photo of our Community Advisory Council. Um, as you can see, um, Ms. Patty Garrity or Dr. Garrity is present. Um, and a lot of the individuals in this photo, although you may not be able to see it, were individuals that were on the photos for the first images that you saw Dr. Waite illustrate. So um, longstanding, enduring members of the community who were still present um, years later. So again, um, the Community Advisory Council, which we also recognize as the CAC as its acronym, was the heart and continues to be the heart of the Stephen Sandra Schaller Love Industry Health Service um, since the center's inception. So the CAC has driven many of the efforts of the center, such as the Patient Ambassadors Program, which I'll discuss later on as well, um, which served to promote and enhance our community, social justice, um, the sanctuary trauma-informed care initiatives, um, this is basically, like I said, prior to a snapshot of the CAC, whose members include local residents, current and former patients, partners, collaborators, as well as our staff. Next slide. So the community centered initiatives anchor um, or are the anchors to our integrative health systems, um, specifically at 11th Street. So as I previously mentioned, um, one of those programs was the Patient Ambassadors Program. And this particular program, which is exemplar, and this is a photo of the Patient Ambassador member um, at the center, was alongside the community members who volunteered their time to further inform current and projected efforts. They promoted our services through in-reach and outreach and established a train and trainer infrastructure to further our integrative approach to healthcare. What I also wanna say about this program and these amazing individuals you see in this photo is that they developed the Patient Ambassadors Program. Um, they sat down um, at a meeting that we had and plenty of meetings, several meetings and discussed how they wanna to continue to help, how they wanna deepen their relationship, not only with their community, but also with the staff and the professional staff, um, the providers at the center. And through conversations and a lot of deliberations and um, illustrations of what that would look like, they developed um, an amazing program, which was a patient ambassadors program. Um, and they were able to really provide experiential support um, and promotion of the services that we provided on a firsthand basis, um, their own experiences. Next slide. This is also another example. Um, this is the annual Turkey Drive. And the annual Turkey Drive was held in collaboration with the university's Institutional Advancement Partnership. Again, as previously noted, um, strategic collaboration and partnership remains essential in our approach. Um, the event was introduced in the center and evolved into a festive annual celebration, which was only made possible through a collective effort of interns, students, members from both the CAC and patient ambassadors um, and volunteers and local agencies. Um, and also because of this collaborative support, the center was able to provide robust meals for over 160 families in our local community on an annual basis. This was also held during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which we're still very much knee deep into that process. Um, but we continued our efforts along with other types of um, efforts that were specifically for individuals that were, um, that needed the support, of course, um, during the pandemic as well. And this is a beautiful illustration of the behind the scenes that most of us do not get to see or experience of community truly coming together to offer meals to families um, who were in need um, and we're expecting it as well. Next slide.
So next we're gonna talk about the evolution of services, clinical health promotion and social services. Um, and so we're gonna have, I have some diagrams here where it really speaks to that clearly. Next slide. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time here on this slide. And one of the things that I wanna say is when the health center first started, um, it started off with primary care. So a family nurse practitioners from Drexel University started providing primary care, as I mentioned earlier, within several rooms of the housing development. Once the building opened, they transitioned over into the building. Once the linkage occurred over a period of time, um, behavioral health, as well as dental came on board as clinical services. What you're seeing here though is much more developed. So over time, there also was an expansion of integrated um, other disciplines, I would say, within these different spaces, predominantly primary care. So within primary care, which we care for individuals across the lifespan, so any individual from three days of age up until death, um, our family nurse practitioners care for. But just to speak a little bit about the different, an array of um, professionals um, and staff that are within primary care are registered nurses who also serve as case managers. We have medical assistants, um, a generalist social worker. We have a nutrition educator who does both individual counseling, but also runs cooking groups and um, performs and supports in classes like our di diabetes education classes. Um, we also have a psychiatric nurse practitioner, licensed um, be a behavioral health consultants, which really support individuals from a prevention as well as for short-term therapy. Um, so we have one behavioral health consultant that really works with moms prenatally up to the age of 17, children up to the age of 17, and then we have one that focuses on adults. Um, and our psychiatric nurse practitioner <clears throat> really supports significantly with medication management. Pre-COVID, we did have some changes, but we also had dental integration um, within primary care so that we had a dental suite. One of our suites transformed into a dental room where basic services, cleaning, fluoride took place, um, particularly with our children to ensure that there was good oral care. We have integrated medical legal um, services. So any, any, I would say person, patient coming in that needed anything except for criminal, they didn't touch anything criminal, but any civil related. So if they're having problems with their landlords, any problems with asbestos, um, just anything at all from a civil related matter, there is an attorney as well as a paralegal that can assist. Podiatry is there once a week, and then we have cardiology, uh, cardiologist that comes in um, once a month. Also within primary care, we have um, our mind-body integration. So um, we have practices of Reiki, mindfulness that can take place with patients in the moment, particularly to help with relaxation when there are issues around anxiety, a numerous, um, a numerous array of different things that our integrated mind-body therapists can engage in. And it's not just within primary care, but that can also take place within dental. With our creative arts therapists, that has transitioned some, um, but our creative arts therapists historically have come down and have been able to engage patients um, sort of in centering and using art therapy and using music therapy, as well as dance movement therapy. Those are services that have come over from the university. So you see the mind body, we have a director of mind body um, services. That Those services truly over the past couple years have been amplified because we have um, a partnership with Silawam, which is an HIV wellness um, organization. And so they lease space within our building and they do an immense amount of mind-body services. So they contribute to things that we are already doing. So they have specialists in Tai Chi and Reiki that come in as well. I mentioned our nutrition. Um, Lady Vez talked a little bit about the community health and wellness. 
we have behavioral health, which is large. So we have the traditional behavioral health um, that encompasses mainly licensed clinical social workers, psychology, a psychologist, um, a psychiatrist, and a nurse practitioner as well. Over the past three years, that has expanded to include licensed professional counselors. Um, and right now, those are our creative arts therapists. We have a social worker, and then we also have physical therapy. Physical therapy are one of the services that's brought over from the university as well. And what's nice about the physical therapy <clears throat> is that they're there two days a week. There's no appointment that's needed. Patients and or community and local hospitals refer patients to our physical therapy department. And there is no cost. It's no fee. Those are services that are dedicated to, um, by the university to the community within the setting of 11th Street. So they get um, a, you know, a lot of patients. And I actually think within our physical therapy department, they have the highest ratio of our Hispanic pa uh, speaking patients um, because one of our uh, physical therapists is fluent in Spanish. And then also I mentioned that we have oral health um, and our oral health department also um, services individuals across the lifespan. So pediat pediatrics, adolescents, as well as adult. And they do a full range of services. However, they don't do root canal um, there, but general dental services they do um, within that space. So there's a lot of integration that happens there. Um, I think I mentioned in primary care, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of, I would probably say, um, unrecognized um, behavioral health, anxiety, depression, um, even other developmental delays that might be occurring with children. And our integrated behavioral health consultants are really skilled to be able to catch that and really be able to refer um, children and create and, and catching some of those developmental um, um, milestones when there's some trouble and issues there. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're really going to take a look at um, the social health component. Um, and I have to say, Dr. Sawyer, several years ago, I'm going to say maybe three years ago, we started working on this because we knew that we provided medical care. But within that medical space, we also knew we address a lot as it pertains to social health. And over the last couple of years, I think many of us have heard the term social determinants of health. I use the term social influencers of health because it's not deterministic at all. Um, but Dr. Sawyer really worked to map out what are those things that we do that really could fall within that realm of social health? Because our goal is really to promote health equity. And so when you're doing that, it's not just about providing medical services. Health is much broader you know, than that. And so we were laying out things um, that will really related. And so this is just a snapshot of some of those things. And so she highlighted here the collaborations that we have, because not only do we have legal services with the medical legal services um, within primary care, we also bring over the legal services from the institution, from Drexel University School of Law. So they come over at least once a month and they do advanced directives, they do living wills, and they do those things. If you can go back, please. Um, and they do, and they provide those services um, for free to anyone, not just individuals who are patients, but also um, individuals who are community members. So that slide gave an array. Then on this slide here, you really get to see some of the other sort of community outreach um, and integration most certainly with COVID testing. So if you hit the slide again, that part will come up that identifies some of the work that we do with COVID testing. Um, you know, with the pandemic, you know, we really were center stage and we were one of the first ones in Philadelphia that really address um, the needs of community with not just drive up, but walk up. Because when you're thinking about driving up, that's also saying you have to have a car. So you're cutting out a large number of individuals from getting the testing. So we started off by doing 
um, testing, and then of course, um, given the vaccine. So we were really active and had drive up as well as walk up. And so this is something that's highlighted here. Um, and because we were early on in doing that, it was also highlighted on ABC on the news. Next slide, please. So I incorporated pictures so you can see some of the sort of the space and what it looks like. We do have a fitness center and I, I just wanna back up and say that while individuals come to the Stephen and Sandra Scheller uh, 11th Street Family Health Services for clinical services, they also come for health promotion services, which are all of our education, diabetes education courses, our cooking classes, our fitness um, training, both as individual as well as in group, as well as all of our mind-body work. Those are all captured under health promotion, and that is open to the community. So you do not have to be a patient to take part in those services, and those services are free. The other additional thing that we have, we do have an on-site pharmacy, um, which is a 340B pharmacy, so it's a low copay. So our pharmacy is not a community-facing pharmacy. It is only for individuals who are receiving clinical services. Um, at the health center. So we do have a full-time fitness coordinator who works not just with community members and patients, but also with staff. Because when you think about wellness, all of the things that we create for community, we create for staff. So staff have mindfulness groups that take place individually as well as group. And we have fitness programs that are for staff um, as well as for community. Within the space of the fitness center, is where our physical therapy is housed. You could see some of the um, rooms for our art therapy, dance movement therapy here. You see some of the wonderful art that we have on the wall. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, some of the things that we do within community, we do take things outside. Um, we engage and work with a lot of students, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. So we bring a lot of um, students from Drexel University within this space because it's a great learning space. Um, both they can learn from community, community can also learn from them as well. And at the bottom, you could see where there's some physical therapy students working with um, patients. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Sawyer now. Thank you, Dr. Wade. This is a great segue to really discuss what we're 11th Street's grounding. Um, so the Stephen Sandra Scheller Family Health Service is really grounded on services, its services practice approach to the sanctuary care model. Um, I know that perhaps most of you are familiar with um, sanctuary. And one thing that we wanna acknowledge is that while many of the components of sanctuary is definitely fundamental to the work that we do, that racism or recognition of racism and really seeking anti-racism principles is not part of sanctuary. And we were able to, to embed um, that particular element into the work that we, um, that we did and continue to do within this space. So I'm just gonna speak briefly in abbreviated um, um, messaging in terms of the four sanctuary, four pillars and how it was uh, constituted within our space. So the trauma theory, again, the first pillar stemming from the theory that we have, that we all have to some extent an experience or exposure um, to some level of trauma, um, therefore acknowledging um, with both uh, our colleagues and as well as our leadership, as well as our patient and community, um, focusing on what happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. So that was also stemming um, across the board in the work that we did um, in our patient care and also community um, engagement. The second um, self, which is, um, we all know that the acronym that stands for safety, emotional management, loss, and future um, was also a framework for treatment and planning, community conversations, collaborative decision-making, and then allow providers, um, as well as co colleagues and, and within our human resources space, um, to focus most importantly on the aspects of helping and healing from trauma in a simple and accessible way. Um, so the center really was able to employ these pillars and tailor, um, tailor our leadership, um, as well as our approach um, uh, based on uh, self as well. So thirdly, the seven commitments, um, the set of values that Sanctuary outlined as a way to lead individuals and organizations away from trauma reactive behaviors, 
was also pivotal um, and it continues to be pivotal within integrative health centers, um, such as the 11th Street Family Health Center. So abbreviated format, you know, the commitment to nonviolence, emotional intelligence, the inquiry and social learning, democracy, commitment to open communication, which is definitely um, an employed aspect of what we practice throughout with our community members, uh, throughout our community advisory councils. Um, again, taking a lot of our services out and being able to truly connect with individuals within our community that we perhaps were not seeing inside the center. Um, and our social responsibility, which was really rebuilding social connection, um, establishing healthy attachments and relationships as well. And lastly, the growth and change. So restoring hope, meaning and purpose. So it was very important and it continues to be very important to make sure within an integrative space that the services that we provide, initiatives that are developed um, or maintained continue to be relevant. And a perfect example to that was what Dr. Wade previously illustrated when we were moving into the pandemic and we were able to say, what, is, what does this shift look like? What are the services that is needed? And what are, what are community members asking for? What do they need? And that was a pivotal question, but also a very, um, a very delicate question to ask because unless you have the report, individuals will not express what the need is. And as a center, especially where we're located, we wanted to make sure that we were meeting the needs, at least the tangible needs of our community. Um, during the pandemic. And lastly, the toolkit. Um, this was also a very resourceful um, element to the work that um, the center continues to employ, which we looked at just tangible examples of toolkits that we were able to tailor um, and develop that made sense to our, to our patients. So an example would be um, having um, tangible small items in the rooms that would allow our patients to feel comfortable Right, whether it's a, a, a stress ball or whether it was um, some kind of a feather or some kind of tool that they can use while they were waiting for the provider to come into the room. Um, and this was basically, um, this was instituted because we wanted to make sure, again, as you we were employing uh, a trauma-informed care approach, we also wanted to ensure that the patients felt comfortable. Another example of that would be the integration of having our music therapist go into the dental um, space, right? The dental office. And not only be there for the patients that were going to see a provider, but also maybe perhaps go into the room if the actual patient felt that they felt anxiety. Because again, being in a dental chair and being examined could be a very compromising position for someone who has been exposed to trauma. So being aware of the different ways that we were able to integrate um, our trauma approach or trauma-informed care approach. And um, next slide, please. So again, as I previously noted that while we, um, we were grounded and anchored on the four pillars in sanctuary, anti-racism and the approach and acknowledgement that racism is definitely, as it says there, socially transmitted disease was pivotal um, and is pivotal to the work that continues to happen in this space. So one of the tailored efforts in which um, laid the foundation for most if not all of the work uh, for anti-racism efforts um, was a lens to anti-racism to care as well as our infrastructure enhanced by our services, but also acknowledge, um, acknowledging racism as an ailment and saying it out loud, um, being able to be explicit with our language, not only with each other as colleagues within a workforce, but also using it in a, as a top-down approach, right? So leadership really emphasizing um, anti-racism. Um, and that is uh, often dismissed. Um, so while the movement towards anti-racism efforts have peaked, and I wanna acknowledge this um, during the years, right? Our recent years with the pandemic and unfortunately um, the George Floyd um, murder, um, we wanna acknowledge that the Stephen and Sandra Scheller Levin Street Health Center um, long-standing efforts towards anti-racism. So many of the efforts that occurred in our space and continue to occur in our space um, has been exercised for years, um, sometimes being the forefront and novel, unfortunately, in this space. Um, and now we're seeing, definitely seeing it magnified, but we definitely felt privileged and felt honored to know that these were conversations that were happening before that time as well. Next slide, please. 
So these are tangible examples, also very profound to the work um, that was that occurs at 11th Street. So undoing racism, the racial affinity groups, as well as our anti-racism advisory council are exemplar to a lot of um, the anti-racism efforts um, in fruition, right? What were developed as a result of, of our foundation and really being able to speak to um, these efforts, but also exercise them in different spaces. Our anti-racism advisory committee was a combination of staff members as well as community members coming together and having very challenging but necessary conversations about racism, not only racism outwardly, right, when we walk at our doors, but also what did that look like in the center? How can we develop policies? Um, how can we develop uh, uh, illustrations or visual aids or infographics that would help individuals understand what racism is, but also how it affects your health and how it's a fundamental layer to social health um, and also as Dr. Wade alluded to, a social influencer of health as well. Next slide. So again, through close collaboration with our community, um, with center departments um, and disciplines across the center, we aim to magnify our approach, as I said earlier, using a tap-down um, approach. So really leadership being at the forefront of a lot of the work that we did. Um, and collectively, we created infographics, as you see in this photo. So these infographics, um, both of the tree, which is our fundamental growing principles of the seven commitments of sanctuary to the right, and then the four um, infographics that you see were at the center and they continue to be at the center um, so that individuals who perhaps may not have a true understanding of what racism is and how it impacts health and what and how does it relate to health, um, health equity in general, this was a moment for them to really have the opportunity to not only speak about it, but to see it, um, which was fundamental to the work that, that we do. So, um, Again, so the infographic centered on anti-racism and its impact on social health as illustrated. Um, so a lot of our efforts are centralized and encapsulating a physical environment to reinforce sanctuary anti-racist approach. I also wanted to highlight, um, and Dr. Wade did a, an amazing um, job doing that previously, that the center was, it is a home. So, not only do we have these different infographics to really depict what, what we were grounded on, but also beautiful walls painted with beautiful colors, bathrooms are gorgeous, right? Because the idea is that when you walk into this space, you wanna feel the sense of not only physical belonging and physical worth, but also that you are in a sanctuary and that you're comfortable. So not only are we providing that care, but we're also reflecting that care in the space, that you are deserving of this care as well. And this was both manifested within um, our community, our patients, and also our workforce. Next slide. So the active academic integration was also, um, it is a pivotal part of the work that we do. Next slide. So these are lovely photos of our amazing um, students to the left. Um, to the right, they're just Drexel University students, of course. Um, so to maximize and promote our approach, um, the Stephen and Sandra Shell Lemon Street Health Center also partnered with Drexel's academic departments, which included the um, College of Nursing and Health Professions, which was a part of um, and is a part of Lemon Street, um, the medical school, and also other external universities and programs to support student services and engagement. The center um, has been very fortunate to have student leaders um, from our co-op programs um, to our, uh, again, public health programs. Um, student leaders that have not only participated in many of our programs, but also developed initiatives, provided outreach and reach. Um, and most importantly, they supported with many of our community efforts and continue to do so. So we've been very, very fortunate to have amazing students um, not only experience the work that we do, but be able to integrate that in their own um, healthcare journey. Next slide. So when we think about um, clinical education, because that also takes place um, at the health center, and I just put some examples here. We have nursing students that are there. 
um, as part of their clinical education, both from undergraduate, as well as for our master's program, working with our nurse practitioners. We have physical therapy students that come over and work with our physical therapists that are there twice a week. Um, we'll get dental students in. We've had students from um, Temple University, but we've also had students from Arizona um, University. Um, they really focus a lot on community, de community dentistry. And while we do not have a school of social work, we've had a number of social work students from local schools such as LaSalle, Bryn Mawr, Widener. So while we do provide a lot of services or a lot of clinical education to students at Drexel University, we also work with other universities and expose um, and work with their students from a clinical education perspective as well. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Very similarly, um, research. Research is a really important component. Um, actually, my entree into the Stephen and Sandra Scheller, and at that time it was the 11th Street Family Health Services Center, was through research. Because I started there around 2005-7 when I was in my postdoctoral research fellowship program. Um, and that was really working and looking at depression among African-American women. And from that study surfaced significant um, aspects of trauma that participants had not even shared with their providers. So that really set us on that foray of focusing on trauma-informed care, which led us to the work around sanctuary. Um, and that was years ago. Um, so we really look at and we work with students both from undergraduate, because I've had research, undergraduate research co-op students with me, um, master's um, students, as well as doctoral students. So there have been doctoral students who have um, conducted their research there. We've had faculty conduct research there, federal grants, as well as foundation related grants. So it really is across the spectrum. But when students do come or any faculty do come and they want to do something within that space and that can range from um, recruitment to you know, really conducting the study within that space, there is a process that has to occur. Um, they typically write up sort of like a one pager on what they wanna do and they interface first with our community advisory committee. And that's including myself. So even when I wanna do research, it goes forth before the community advisory committee. Because what I can say is that when you're sharing what you're going to do, they give some awesome feedback. From their lens, they share things that you might not even think about. Where I know for myself earlier on, there have been, from a recruitment standpoint, there have been changes based on feedback. So it does come before the CAC. Um, if, it's, uh, if they haven't done it already, they go through the IRB. And even once the research is completed, we also have individuals come back and share with the community as well as with staff as necessary, sort of the findings from their research. So it is variable. Sometimes it's recruitment um, and the person might just be there recruiting to where research studies actually take place within the space. So it's variable across, but again, it's a really enriching and dynamic place, but we wanna make sure whatever research is being conducted, that it's a benefit to the community and it's shared with the community. Next slide, please. So we wanna thank you for your time. We do wanna have time for opening up for questions. So we both have our contact information. Mine is on this slide, again, with my link, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Um, and then Dr. Sawyers is on the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, her contact information is on this slide as well. And then if you hit the next slide is we're open up for Q&A and we really just wanna thank you for your attention to our discussion. I know we brought up a lot of content. There might be areas where you might wanna have a deeper dive and we could answer any questions that you have. Well, first, I just want to thank you both so much. It was an amazing presentation. Um, even even getting a chance to speak with you all ahead of time, I don't think I fully um, pictured kind of all of the effort and 
uh, just everything that goes into running the center um, and the really truly comprehensive approach um, that the center has, which is just phenomenal to see. Um, I personally have questions, but I wanna leave the questions to the participants too. So let's start there because I know some of them popped up in the chat as you all were um, discussing. So first question that popped up was, um, there was a question about who the sellers or the shellers are. So I don't know well, if you I can, I can answer yeah. that. So the mm -hmm. shellers are major donors. So if you, in 2015, when I talked about the expansion, they contributed several million dollars for the building expansion. And so it was renamed. So we kept the 11th Street Family Health Services Center, but their names are in the front. <clears throat> They're major donors. They've been longtime supporters. Um, Sandra Scheller, went through the creative arts therapies department at the College of Nursing and Health Professions. So she really has a strong passion, passion for creative arts therapies. And her husband is an attorney. Um, so they've been longtime supporters of the 11th Street Family Health Services Center. Just to kind of, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to hear that um, just because, you know, when you think about what it takes to create a center, and again, I understand that it didn't start off like that, right? You know, when you were first describing it, you said it was just the two rooms and the, and the, and the housing, uh, you know, community and, you know, while the building was actually being built, but, you know, to kind of hear, to see all the services that are offered now, it's, it's really helpful to understand that all that was needed to kind of get it to there. And one is the philanthropic donation. The other one is most likely the partnership with Drexel, you know, so really understanding what is necessary to bring something like this to, to life. So I, I appreciate that question because it kind of helped illuminate that even further. Um, Let me just, just add just a little yeah, bit to what you just please. said, because I think yeah. the other piece that needs to be illuminated um, is the linkage because that helps to sustain, particularly from um, federal funds to support because 60% of our patients are on Medicaid. So with the FQHC, it really helps to support the services that are being provided and funding um, some of the positions that are there. And then many other things have been grant funded. So grants have allowed, I would probably say much of the innovation that has occurred. So just for an example, we didn't have all of those disciplines in the beginning. So for our mind-body position, for our nutrition position, for our behavioral health consultant positions that are part of primary care, they were not there initially. They were all grant-funded positions. And then after a period of time in showing and demonstrating the effectiveness of them, then they rolled onto the FQHC budget and then the other centers developed those roles as well because they did not have those roles. That's really important to note. I appreciate that, Dr. Waite, because I was going to, you know, it, it is, again, um, I think there is an appetite to fund, you know, kind of what is considered traditional um, care, um, but there's not so much of an appetite to fund things that really are kind of what has been folded into the center that speak more to um, the social influencers, as you pointed out earlier. Um, so that's really, I appreciate that clarification too. So it just shows the building over time, you know, yeah. and I yeah. would probably say a lot of that initially was um, the innovation was through grant funding, right? So we yeah. were able to create different roles and mm -hmm. to see how it fit, to mm -hmm. see how it functioned, to see the effectiveness of it. Um, and then from there, it was spread at the other centers. And then it also was able to move on to the FQHC budget. And if you could, just real quick, before we move on to the next question, I just want to make sure folks um, on, the, on the line understand what an FQHC is. So FQHC then, stands for Federally Qualified Healthcare Center. Okay. And that's administered through uh, the federal government? The federal government, correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So um, they have full FQHC centers where mm -hmm. you're getting full reimbursement, and then they have lookalike. So you may not get paid as high of a rat rate, but it's called an FQHC lookalike. Interesting. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you for that too. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, okay. So moving on to the, the next question, it said, um, I noticed you offer complimentary health practitioners like Reiki and yoga. Do you find that the FQHC requirements limit these practitioners to needing other licenses like nursing license to practice, or do they allow other traditional pra uh, practitioners to be part of the program offering? No, they're not, they're not nurses. So other traditional um, practitioners are part of it. 
Okay, so in, I think that I think that kind of came up to you had mentioned that um, after first, I think I missed how they were initially funded because you eventually did say after they demonstrated actual effectiveness, they were included in the FQHC budget, right? Correct. So for mind body practitioners, mm -hmm. um, they were initially grant funded. And so now each one of the sites has one. But at our site, it's really a little bit more robust because we also, through our partnership with Siloan, all of their things are health promotion. So when you're working with their clients, they also have Tai Chi, they have Reiki, and they have other modalities that they also bring within that space. So mm -hmm. our patients and community members have access to those services as well. Okay, great. Um, we do have a couple more questions in the uh, Q&A feature. So um, I know we're kind of uh, got about three minutes left, but I just wanted to make sure if you both are okay for hanging on to just uh -huh. to answer these. Okay, great. So um, the, the, the first question is, is um, what is the co-op as it is being used here? Um, is there an actual cooperative or is it a group or a shared process or shared processes of learning? That's a great question. So the co-op in this context um, is really in partnership with Drexel University. So Drexel University's um, undergraduate program has a co-op program embedded in their academic programming. Um, so basically you're essentially the students who are Drexel University students have an opportunity to co-op, uh, meaning um, either for one year, two years, three years, depending on the discipline. And they then have the experience in this co-op to actually work and gain experience. Um, so in collaboration with Drexel Universities, we were um, 11th Street Health Center, or we are 11th Street Health Center, are able to provide a space for a co-op student to experience that work environment with us. And a lot of that work really entails, again, coming into the center, is as if you know they were, again, they're a professional staff, they're our colleagues. We invite them to come in and be able to share experiences, be able to really um, stretch their wings um, with guidance and support, of course, and get the experience that they need. So a lot of their work is, is working closely with community and doing other, um, other related um, tasks and so forth. So to answer the question, the co-op basically is a student coming into our space and for a certain length of time, I think it's three months, Dr. Wei, I can't recall the, the exact amount of time that they would actually work with us alongside us at uh, the Stephen and Sandra Shell 11th Street Health Center. So it's for two quarters. So they actually have their co-op either fall, winter or spring, mm -hmm. summer. Uh, so it's for six months, but it's part of all undergraduate um, programs at Drexel and students either go to school for four years and get one co-op or they go to school for five years and they do three co-ops mm -hmm. and they get paid, as Dr. Sawyer mentioned, it's if they were a staff member working at any establishment. So it's just not 11th Street. It's all of the businesses, hospitals, mm -hmm. they go every place to work and they get paid during that time like they're mm -hmm. a regular staff member, but it's also part of their academic requirement. So if they don't do it or if they don't pass their co-op, that's not a good thing because it's part of their credit load. Wow, that's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it, uh, another great question. Um, so the next question is, is um, are you the only health center like this in the country? It's a, yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it should be a model on how to do a community health, especially with racism, education and understanding of trauma. So um, I don't know if you all do know whether or not, um, although I'd like to think that maybe the federal government keeps FQHCs together, like it helps to learn from each other, facilitates learning from each other, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, well, what I can say is just like a community, one health center is one health center. <laughs> so, you know, there are probably parts of what we do in different places. And I'm sure there are other health centers that have things that we don't, because we don't have everything, right? I think it needs to fit the needs of the community. There are probably some commonalities. Um, it is a leading health center. So we are a model of care by AHRQ, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but there are some other phenomenal health centers as well. Within Philadelphia, they have the um, NNCC, which is the nursing led health um, care centers. And so some of them, some actually just have behavioral health. Some just have primary care. 
um, you know, some across the board. So it really does, you know, where they encompass a lot. So, but it really does vary, right? I don't know of one that's exactly like ours, but I know of other phenomenal, you know, FQHCs and health centers. Great. All right, thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the response. And then the, we'll have this be the last question. Um, what kind of nutrition issues typically come up um, as a, so the um, a person writing this, uh, as a recent caregiver um, uh, for her mother, um, she learned how difficult it can be to get people to eat healthy um, when they want to eat uh, what they are culturally used to. Yeah, I mean, I can speak a little bit to this. And I mean, when you say what kind of nutrition issues, I mean, it really is across the lifespan. So you have to work with children. And I would even say not even with children, you have to work with moms who are pregnant, because you really want to start even prenatally, right? Um, but of course, we're in a space where you could identify, say, we have a food desert. So just until recently, there were not a lot of food markets. More recently, we've been having more built. And I do think that's because of the gentrification, significant gentrification that's happening in the area. So as a result of that, we do and had partnerships with um, like St. Christopher's where we had um, fresh boxes of fruits and vegetables that community members could purchase subsidized that could really help supplement for that. And then we also have right now a phenomenal nutrition educator where she really identifies how you can make things healthy, even low cost, right? So even if you had to use canned things, how you can make things and produce them in a healthier way. Um, so right now, fortunately, there are some lower cost places within the area, like Aldi's, they are building a giant, which to me, I think is more costly, but at least they're having some other options outside of going to corner stores. However, there can be opportunities of partnering with corner stores, particularly larger organizations to support them with providing healthier choices, right? So there are many opportunities that can still happen in, within these spaces, but there is a lot of learning that also has to occur, including access for how we normally might prepare foods that are more palatable. So we learn from and with each other, particularly within those cooking classes, because they share, what are the seasonings? How do they normally cook X, right? And so the nutritionist can really work and say, how can we make this healthier, but it can still have flavor, right? So really working with individuals, um, with families during cooking classes, but then also with individuals during cooking classes, particularly our diabetes education classes can be really powerful. I can say one of the biggest classes that is always full is our taste of African heritage. We have a lot of different, but that's the one that's always full. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. And it's fantastic that you have that too. So yeah, all right. Well, again, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I greatly appreciate you both spending the time with us um, tonight. It was an amazing presentation. Um, and really, thank you again so, so much. Um, and thank you to everybody else who joined us to hear this presentation live tonight. Thank, thank you, you so both. much for having us. We really were honored to be here. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Right. Take care. Okay, take care.